will now turn to Daniel to um, fill us in on the, I have to say, the gory details. Um, who Daniel has actually been one of the people who has uncovered most uh, spectacularly and sadly the gory details of this uh, terrible uh, uh, set of crimes in uh, Ayachinapa uh, with the 43 students uh, killed. Uh, Daniel is the news bureau chief for Mexico for Vice News. People have come to see more and more of Vice News uh, in various media forms. He was previously uh, a writer for the Los Angeles Times in Mexico, and he is the author of Down and Delirious in Mexico City, uh, Scribner uh, 2011. And I, I, I wanted to uh, emphasize the degree to which Daniel has been really at the center of the expose and explication and exploration of the political implications of the, this, ter this terrible crimes, the political movement that's come up in response, and the political uh, response to that of the state and the official forces. So we're very delighted to have uh, Daniel, along with Christy, uh, speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Professor, for that introduction. Thank you, Christy. It was amazing uh, for that review. I found myself nodding quite a bit in there, listening to things that um, uh, I, I will touch on as well. And uh, in particular, um, the use of uh, the political structure in Mexico to sustain and to foment uh, this violence that we've been um, covering. Uh, I moved to Mexico in late 2007. I covered the 2006 election um, for the El Hate Weekly. Uh, I was a staff writer here at the time, and I got sent um, by the editor of the LA Weekly on one of the last foreign assignments that they permitted uh, for the staff here because we've always felt that um, Los Angeles is so close to Mexico. Los Angeles is an, uh, a Mexican identity um, to its identity as a city and as a collection of people. Um, it's the second largest Mexican city in the world after Mexico City. Um, so we've always thought that it's been very important for, for us to know what the hell is going on in Mexico, right? Um, in the midst of all this violence and these headlines that we've seen. Um, so I, I will touch on that a bit, and I'll start by um, just acknowledging um, uh, the center that invited us, and Tom and, and, and Susie, thank you as well. Um, so when I moved to Mexico, I didn't really know what was going on. I mean, like a lot of uh, possibly you here in this room, um, uh, there's some interest in Mexico, there's some um, sort of uh, awareness that we should know about Mexico, that we should care about Mexico, but we're not usually sure in many cases how to make that entry point and how to um, get close to Mexico to kind of understand the history of what's going on there. My parents are from Tijuana. Um, I'd never really been deeper into Mexico than, than Tijuana and Ensenada until I had decided uh, to move there and check it out myself and really try to understand it. Um, when I first went there, I did not gain a better understanding <laughs> of Mexico. I think everything that I had thought I knew about Mexico was complicated and flipped and contradicted. And I found myself in that contradiction being more drawn in and being uh, uh, feeling that I was uh, I needed to challenge myself to really get Mexico and really understand Mexico. So I decided after um, a year or so of um, kind of batting around <laughs> the idea of moving there and settling there and wanting to help Mexico in the way that I could, which for me is the practice of journalism. And journalism permits me to not only um, physically, literally see a lot of these issues up close and up front, uh, but also try and explain it for the people here and, and try and explain it for readers and consumers of news and information here that um, in a way that I hope uh, gains a little bit more understanding uh, for people. Because right now, if you go to Mexico or if you watch or listen to whatever is said about Mexico in the official channels, including the United States, uh, from the State Department to the White House to even the mayor's office here in Mexico um, or anywhere, uh, is that Mexico is this wonderful, great place and a great place to, to visit and to and, and to invest and, and to um, and to cheer on. Um, 
Mexico is a great place to visit. <laughs> it is a, a wonderful place uh, to live, but in this uh, space uh, that is created by this narrative, um, you automatically see the contradictions and, and the lies that exist um, in in that in that narrative. And in Mexico, in particular, um, it's mostly this <coughs> belligerent and constant steam, stream of uh, propaganda that um, tells Mexican uh, residents and citizens on a daily basis how great the country is, how much the Supreme Court is working for you and the lower house of Congress is working you, for you and how much Peña Nieto is working for you or whatever president is in office at the time. Uh, in Mexico, we are under a constant stream and barrage of this kind of uh, government propaganda on the radio, on television, even in movie theaters and the previews before you sit down to watch a film in a cinema, you get um, hit with some government propaganda. So um, it's something that uh, sustains a lot of economies there as well. Um, Mexican newspapers and magazines live almost entirely on the propaganda that is published by the government. Um, so that also is another factor that reduces the ability of Mexican news outlets to question and to really um, publish the truth of, of what's going on. So um, I got there in 2007, I kind of knew that something was going on, that uh, drug violence was increasing. Um, Mexico City was a great place to be at the time because uh, for the most part, we were uh, immune to the violence that was uh, springing up in that period at first in Michoacan. Uh, Felipe Calderon uh, first sent the military to the streets in December 2006. Uh, just a few weeks, three weeks, I think, um, after he took office in this uh, inauguration in which he literally had to muscle his way to the podium. He got sneaked in uh, to the congressional chambers where he was uh, to put on this sash. And this is a formal uh, ceremony that in most cases is, you know, how most inaugurations go and like the one that we have here in the U.S. Um, here, the PRD and the parties who were, um, and the, the, the politicians who were supporting Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and called AMLO the legitimate president uh, for, for a long time after that, election um, were trying to physically prevent Felipe Calderón from taking office. This was a disastrous uh, public event that, when transmitted in the headlines, really um, was quite embarrassing for the new government and the new administration that Felipe Calderón, like it or not, was going to um, take control of. Uh, so what did he do? He had to legitimize himself and, and, and his method. Um, was to send the military to the streets. Uh, the first place that he did this was in Michoacan. Um, he wore a green fatigue jacket. He declared war, although interestingly, um, the government has since tried to erase as much as possible references to Felipe Calderon's early statements about the uses of the military and the federal police. Um, in that period, uh, he, he used the term war quite a few times for those f first few months. And it was something that probably went over our heads on both sides of the border. But as we were to see by the end of 2007, and particularly by the, end of by the beginning of 2008, when the violence just went through the roof, that it really was a war. And we really were in a state of conflict. Um, nine years later, there have been millions of people affected, millions of people displaced, uh, millions of families that are still mourning uh, victims, millions of families uh, prob or people that are waiting uh, for their loved ones to return, people who went outside one day and simply disappeared, were never heard of, uh, from again, people who were snatched on the street, uh, people who were killed for being in a bar at the wrong hour, in the wrong place, uh, being maybe in a casino, as would happen with the Casino Royale in Monterrey in 2011. Uh, there have been, yes, more than 100,000, um, but I think it's probably much more than that. In uh, 2011, I believe it was uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, who made a reference in public statements to 150,000 dead. That was in 2011, just about, uh, you know, five years into the conflict. And then he later, he was the new uh, DOD chief, and then he later said, oh, that was a mistake. I'm sorry I exaggerated. But 
<laughs> the message there was probably that that's probably what the U.S. military believed at that time, just five years into the conflict, that 150,000 people had been killed. Now we're nearing nine years, and the violence has really not stopped and not been affected. In fact, it's gone up in a lot of different places. Um, so I lived in Mexico in the worst period of the conflict. I wasn't expecting to, to live there uh, in a state of war. I sometimes say that this is the period that turned me goth in Mexico. <laughs> we were surrounded by death. We were surrounded by darkness and by the, the prospect of, of, of seeing death and violence in really, um, really grotesque forms up and down um, the country. Uh, so since the earliest uh, beginnings of the drug trade, um, which we date back to about the 19th century, the late 19th century, with the arrival of uh, opium with Chinese immigrants, uh, it was actually quite a peaceful um, trade. Uh, the U.S. military um, during World War II, according to recent um, uh, work that I've seen done on this, uh, was probably okay and was probably um, importing Mexican opium. Uh, to help U.S. soldiers in World War II. Um, the plaza system was a uh, wonderful system that permitted politicians and growers and drug traffickers uh, to profit from this industry and maintain it. Uh, through the 20th century, um, and this is something that I've just read um, and had a great recent summary by uh, Carmen Buyosa and Mike Wallace, a book called The Narco History that was just published that is um, quite good. Um, so all of this is very fresh in my mind because I've just read this book and, and it shows you really how close and how linked the Mexican state has been with the traffickers uh, since the beginning. So by the time Felipe Calderón comes around, um, he needs to um, uh, uh, um, deflate the power and the anger of the movement uh, in the post-election uh, period with AMLO. They needed to silence El Peje. He needed to legitimize himself. So therefore, he declared war on drugs in Mexico. But I think essentially he was declaring war on Mexico, on behalf of Mexico. He was saying that we are going to attack the cartels and attack the drug industry. But in doing so, you were attacking Mexico itself, because Mexico itself by then had, as, as Christy explained, taken uh, really the wholesale production and distribution of drugs from Colombia and, 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 and used it for its own gain. Um, so we've seen uh, what that has caused. Um, by last count, I think it's about 2.5 billion in, in direct US aid, although um, I've see, also seen counts of 2.8. Uh, officially, 121,000 people dead up to this point. Um, I think that number, of course, is low. Hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes. Uh, 281,000 was the last count, lowest estimate reported by the Norwegian uh, Refugee Council earlier this month, which we reported. Um, that makes it, I think, only second to Colombia and the Americas now, and, Ameri and Colombia still has the most people have displaced with about 6 million and a long list of abuses and organized terror at the hands of organized crime in the Mexican state. And I think uh, we need to acknowledge Ayotzinapa and also uh, the recent cases in Tlatlaya, Estado de Mexico, in which uh, 22 civilians were killed, mostly unarmed, executed by the Mexican military. Um, a massacre in Apatzingan, Michoacan, which occurred, um, I think it was in January, 16 civilians who were killed by Mexican federal police. And just uh, on May 1st in Tanwato, Michoacan, on a ranch, um, you've heard of probably the headlines of the 43 civilians killed and one federal police officer killed in what the government is still describing as a shootout and as a battle. Um, but if we know anything about the precedent of, of the way the military and the federal police behaves, if there's that many dead, you can almost bet that there were um, summary ex extrajudicial <laughs> executions of, of civilians, probable criminals. Uh, but some of our reporters have recently gone to the hometowns of some of these individuals who were killed at this ranch, and their family members, of course, are, are mourning and, and are and are and 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 are dealing with this loss, and just saying that these were young teenagers who got offered a job in this context which you've described in which there are few opportunities other than joining the cartels or migrating to the United States. So these young men, whether criminals or delinquents or, or not, um, uh, were um, probably killed uh, by Mexican federal forces. And that's a story that's in development and ongoing right now in Mexico. 
You could add also the 72 migrants executed in San Fernando de Tamaulipas in 2010 by the Setas. Um, another element of this is the way the cartels moved into human trafficking and began managing and controlling uh, the flow of migrants from Central and South America. Most of those victims were Central American. Many of them were also Ecuadorian, uh, a few Brazilians and Peruvians. Um, this is an ongoing crisis. It's affected hundreds of thousands of people on the east coast of Mexico along the La Bestia, the train uh, that travels, that is used both by um, traffickers and by human traffickers to move individuals north into the United States labor market, essentially. And also the 300 people who were kidnapped and probably incinerated in Allende, Coahuila. This was a story that we broke at Vice by reporter Diego Enrico Sorno in an incident probably also blamed on the Setas in 2011 in which um, a basic revenge, and I think so many things, and so many of the atrocities in Mexico are the result of uh, uh, a basic, very fundamental element of, of, of human conflict and of human drama, which is revenge. Um, a, a, a faction of the Setas were probably seeking revenge on a guy who had turned into a, a, a U.S. informant, <laughs> strolled into the town where he was from, these brothers, and took everyone from uh, grandmothers, uh, reportedly, to maids and gardeners, uh, anyone who was affiliated to one of these uh, two brothers, and took them to these ranches and, and most likely incinerated them uh, in this horrible, horrible fashion. And one of our reporters, Diego Enrico Sorno, went there to these ranches, took photographs and interviewed people, and he uh, created, a, uh, built a narrative uh, describing how this happened, and it was a pretty horrific, horrific story. And uh, the hundreds and possibly thousands of people dumped in mass graves in Tamaulipas, in Veracruz, Jalisco, Coahuila, Zacatecas, Durango, Guerrero, uh, many in Guerrero, all states and all regions of Mexico um, that have close ties to the United States uh, because of migration and because of the transnational uh, communities that have created and, and people who are really, really, really in pain and, and really hurting from, uh, from uh, this conflict. And I think it's important to frame it as a conflict at this point and, and something that goes against what the United States wants us to believe officially and what Mexico wants us to believe. They try to convince us that we're not in war. But I think if we were to uh, blast ourselves into the future in 50 years, uh, this conflict that Mexico is experiencing right now will be seen as, as one of the most horrific in, in between these uh, at the start of the 21st uh, century. Uh, so now we're in, in this context, we're in a political campaign. Mexico uh, next Sunday is going to vote for hundreds of offices in the um, Congress, nine uh, state governors, and a bunch of mayoral candidates. And uh, the drug issue and the way the cartels rule Mexico is really played out uh, mostly at a local level. It's the way mayors local uh, political leaders and local bosses uh, coordinate and try to, as best they can, in many ways, um, uh, suppress the violence. And uh, if they can't suppress the violence, they try to suppress the information about the violence. And um, it's almost, um, it's almost, um, uh, how could I put it? Well, the, um, these local leaders um, are trying to do the best they can. Uh, they are, uh, so they have to sort of engage in corruption in order, in their opinion, to prevent the violence from spreading or really affecting them. So they get into deals with local um, gang leaders and cartel leaders to try to kind of strike a deal and say, okay, you can run drugs through my municipality, but please don't hurt the civilian population. Um, when that doesn't work out, when let's say a political figure at the local level wants to say, look, I'm going to be an actual a good politician. I'm not going to be corrupt. I'm going uh, to not get into a deal with a cartel figure um, and see what happens and maybe that way um, help help prevent the violence and maybe that way gain, gain the trust of the population that is sick and tired of, of the violence <laughs> and the corruption. When that happens, uh, a lot of those local political figures get attacked or assassinated. And so far in this campaign, we've seen, according to Reforma, a newspaper in Mexico City, 70 political attacks, including uh, 18 fatalities, uh, threats to people's homes and properties, threats to people's families, <coughs> and uh, the assassinations of not only uh, political candidates, but also campaign managers, operators, local party bosses, uh, volunteers, and even supporters um, caught up at campaign events. So we're looking at a narco 
uh, state uh, dealing with the narco election and all of these uh, low level uh, figures who are uh, for good or ill trying to do the best they can in this situation being caught in the middle and caught in the crossfire and the civilians um, as well. I think on May 14th, a, a mayoral candidate was shot drive-by style in Michoacan in the middle of a campaign event um, in Yurecuaro, Michoacan. Last Wednesday night, the campaign manager for a PRI candidate in a borough of Mexico City, Azcapotzalco, was killed while sitting in a campaign truck uh, <laughs> outside of the campaign offices of his, of his candidate. And that's an interesting uh, flip side because the PRD is, is, governs Mexico City and the PRI is, within Mexico City is a, an opposition force. So you can see the levels of corruption with the PRD at the local level in Mexico City if, if we're to believe that he was attacked for not kind of going along the lines with the, with the PRD. Um, so uh, as with most of these attacks, they will probably never be properly investigated, never be properly prosecuted, and for the most part, we will never find out why these individuals uh, were targeted, leaving in that void of information the suspicion that the victims were somehow involved or somehow dealt with organized crime and therefore somehow deserved uh, their fate. And this has been a logic used by the government of Felipe Calderón and has also now been transferred over to the government of uh, Peña Nieto. Uh, recently, myself and a Vice News crew were interviewing the ex-director of sort of the intelligence agency for organized crime called CISEN in Mexico under Felipe Calderón, a man named Guillermo Valdez. We went and interviewed him, and he was a um, very pleasant man, very, um, for the most part, smart. And then he kind of gave me this figure uh, that was shocking and just made my jaw, jaw drop. And I had to kind of stop him because he said 95% of the victims of this figure of 100 or 120 or 150,000 or more, 95% um, of those he uh, claims and Calderon claims still uh, were related to organized crime, meaning blaming the victim, essentially re-killing the victims again in a statement that is impossible to verify because only 2% of crimes are ever investigated and only a fraction of that are ever properly prose successfully prosecuted and resulting in a criminal sentence. So we have no idea who is dying. We have no idea why they're dying, and we will never find out, which I think is uh, enormous uh, human rights and justice failure that, that we all have to confront, really, and, 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 in, and in generations to come, we will still be confronting and, 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 and facing uh, this nightmare. Uh, so people, I would say now in Mexico, are <laughs> exasperated uh, with the political system, uh, exasperated with the process, and I think so far this election has only been demonstrating to us how deeply entrenched organized crime has become in Mexican politics. And especially, as I said, at the local level. Uh, so you know, that made me think of a, of a comment that a friend of mine recently made saying that in Mexico, you can't really get ahead unless you work for the cartels or for the PRI. And in most cases, uh, that's, they're kind of one and the same. And this is the this is the reality that people uh, in your generation and our generation are, are confronting that there is so few opportunities but to work for uh, the the narco state um, because that, you know everyone knows that the pre and the Mexican political systems are so corrupt that the structure that they offer offers stability of employment offers the kind of scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, benefit of impunity and the lack of justice, bonuses for good behavior, and the prospect of being as long as you stay in line, protected by the lords of, of power. So voters are also seduced by the narco state, uh, represented you know, by the old PRI practices of hands out, handouts and of promises of jobs, and people uh, not only benefiting from the drug uh, profits, uh, but also from uh, television sets, uh, tortillas wrapped in paper and blazoned with uh, the logos and the campaign slogans of certain candidates, um, backpacks, uh, jackets, umbrellas. It's rainy season now in Mexico City, so now you can see, and it's political season, so now you can see the different parties represented uh, by people who are not necessarily uh, uh, fans of certain political parties, but a lady who needs an umbrella on a rainy day. 
Um, and so you see the propagation of, of, of these goods handed out and, and really the kind of just naked uh, corruption and impunity that exists uh, between uh, uh, the parties and, and the political system.